Um, I'm Elizabeth Hargrave. I'm the vice president of Ma, and I am really happy that folks have joined us tonight for this presentation um, by Carrie Seltzer from iNaturalist. This is um, something that has been sort of on our to-do list for a while to get more Ma folks engaged with iNaturalist and to use iNaturalist a little bit more at Ma activities. And um, when Carrie reached out to me about the upcoming City Nature Challenge, which we'll talk about a little bit tonight, um, I was excited to use that as an excuse to um, to push a little bit more on, on getting folks up to speed on iNaturalist. All right, thanks so much, Elizabeth. I'm really excited to be presenting to you all tonight. I should add a disclaimer that I'm not an expert in fungi at all. I'm an expert in using iNaturalist. So um, I am excited to share with you all some, um, some tips and tricks that might be helpful for you in um, using iNaturalist to explore, um, explore with Ma. So I am based in Washington, DC. I'm an ecologist professionally. Um, I work for iNaturalist. I'm employed remotely 100% by the California Academy of Sciences. Most of my colleagues are in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and iNaturalist is a joint initiative of the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic Society here in Washington, DC. When in-person meetings were a thing, it was convenient for me to be here to, to go to meetings at National Geographic. Um, but um, the, the, the all virtual thing has, has worked out pretty well for iNaturalist. Um, iNaturalist is pretty well suited to the pandemic since you can explore on your own and get your social interaction um, through the platform. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about how all that works. So at its core, iNaturalist seeks to connect people to nature through technology. And the core unit of interaction an iNaturalist happens around observations. So for example, if you see a butterfly, you take a picture of it with your cell phone or with a digital camera, then you upload it to iNaturalist. And even if you don't know what you saw, other people in the community can weigh in on the identification. Um, you can think of each observation that you share as an invitation to a discussion about what it is that you saw. And in aggregate, all of the observations that people share and all of the identification expertise that people share through iNaturalist leads to this, this global emergent map of, of biodiversity across the world, which makes for some pretty interesting um, data exploration too, and research and conservation applications. So the core pieces of an observation are a user, who you are. Um, you don't have to have your real name associated with your account on iNaturalist, but you do need to have an account to post to iNaturalist. We need to know where you saw it, needs to have coordinates associated with it. There should, um, ideally should be some evidence of what you saw. So overwhelmingly that evidence comes in the form of photos, but can also be sound. You can make an observation that doesn't have evidence associated with it, but in that case, the community won't be able to weigh in on the identification, but you can do those for your, for your own record. Um, if, if you'd like to keep, keep a complete list of things you saw, even if you weren't able to get a photo. We need to know when you saw it, at minimum the date. Oftentimes now, you know, with digital cameras, the timestamp comes in automatically. And then there's this piece of what you saw. So if you don't, if you know what you saw, you can add the, add the identification. But even if you don't, this is where the community will come in. So 
it's also important to remember that iNaturalist, um, kind of similar to Facebook or, or other social media, it works across multiple interfaces. So we have a free app for iPhone, we have a free app for Android, works on tablets, um, and then we've got the website, which has the most extensive functionality, greatest number of features, best tools for um, for exploring other people's observations and identifying them. Um, most of the screenshots that I'm gonna show today are gonna be from the website. If you've only explored the app so far, I do encourage you to explore the website as well because you can do more. The apps are really a bit more specialized and, and narrow in terms of being focused on helping you make and share your observations and a lot more of the interactive features are available on the website. So now we're going to talk about what makes a good observation specifically in the context of mushrooms and I'm going to let Elizabeth talk about this part um, while I do the slides. So this uh, first slide, I'm really just picking on my dad who likes to send me a lot of mushroom photos. <laughs> um, and we, who, to whom I have been saying for years, dad, I can't ID this mushroom from this photograph. <laughs> there are certain things I need to see. And so I want to, I'm assuming that folks on this call are, you know, ranging from expert mushroomers all the way down to sort of beginners. So I thought it would be worth spending a few minutes just reviewing like what makes a good observation uh, that you can put up on the iNaturalist and actually have some hope of people being able to help you. Next slide. Um, so one thing is it's really, really important to take pictures from multiple angles and especially um, in addition to angles like the one I just showed you, we need to see the fertile surface. So the gills or the pores on the underside of the cap are super, super important, especially even just the fact whether the mushroom has gills or pores um, is super important, but also the colors and, and spacing and things like that can be really important for identification. So this is a, a good example of one way to do that where you can get it all in one picture by picking, if you have multiple mushrooms, you can pick one and stick it upside down or on its side next to the group of mushrooms and that really improves your chances of someone being able to tell what it is. Um, so further along those lines, there are other things, other parts of the mushroom that can be really um, important identifying features. So here's a series of photos that John Harper took of a mushroom. Um, so the first one is that typical like top down picture that you get from people that are just starting to be curious about mushrooms that only gets you so far. Um, the second one gives you sort of a sense of the, the shape and the growth habit. Um, but then he's got a couple extra ones that are showing uh, important things on the stalk. So in that middle one, you can see there's a little bit of a ring on the stalk. And the, and then the fourth picture, you can see that the, the stalk actually forms sort of a bulb on the bottom, which is really important and which you can't see in the first couple photos, right? But he actually sort of dug down into the soil a little bit to check what was going on at the base of the mushroom. And then that last picture, he's actually cut it in half, which gives you a really clear, clear view of how the gills um, approach the stalk and um, the way that there's sort of that gap there between the gills and the stalk is another important um, kind of shape that, that we sometimes are looking for when we ID mushrooms. Um, it, for some mushrooms, it can be really helpful to know where it was growing and not just in the iNaturalist sense of the, the GPS coordinates, but knowing um, what it was growing in association with and what type of substrate it was growing on. So a lot of mushrooms grow only on soil or only on wood or only on something you know, very specific. Um, many are associated with specific tree species. So like the Suillus picture is great because you always find swillus under pine trees and here it is clearly with a bunch of pine needles and that's like really going to help with the id of that set of mushrooms 
Um, some mushrooms tend to grow like specifically singly or in very tight clusters. So honey mushrooms you'll always find coming out of a base like that. And um, if you pick just one of those mushrooms and took a picture of it, it might throw off an identifier who would expect honeys to come in a, in a cluster like that. Um, it can be really helpful to check what happens when you cut or, or um, bruise a mushroom. You'll get um, things that are important for the identification that you might not have even thought to look for. So I always like to check if I think it might be a lactarius. So you gotta cut the gills and see if it bleeds some milk. And similarly with the bolites, uh, um, if you've explored that set of mushrooms at all, you'll know that uh, that blue staining reactions are really important for identifying bolites. And then, um, you know, this you can't do in the field as much, although sometimes you will see fallen spores, but um, taking a spore print, you can do this after the fact and go back and add it to, to an observation you made in the field. Um, cause if you, if you've got something where it really is tough to identify and, and you're not sure what it is from all the other characteristics, taking a spore print can, can get you a long way. All right. So, um, now we're going to show a little bit about how to make an observation in the iPhone app. Um, I'll just add that those all of those suggestions that are um, that have been shared in the context of mushrooms apply in a lot of ways to other organisms, especially when it comes to getting multiple angles and um, and uh, sometimes um, uh, associations with other other species. Those things can can be important for other groups of organisms too. So, generally, good advice to get multiple views. Um, you can add multiple photos to a single observation and that can really help with the identification. So what I have here, if this will play, yeah, is, is um, this is a screen recording of, of my iPhone um, making an observation. In this case, I'm making an observation from my camera roll. Um, so you'll see here that I go to my favorites, which is, a way that I will, if I've taken just a whole bunch of photos, I'll go through and I'll add favorites to the ones that I want to post to iNaturalist. Um, and that helps me be able to find them a bit more easily when I'm going back through my camera roll. You can also use the app in the field um, and make observations as you go in the field. Um, I, I, I do both. It kind of depends on the day, depends on how fast the, if I'm hiking with my fast friends, I don't use the app. I just take pictures and I keep moving. Um, if, I, if I'm out on my own or with my slow iNaturalist friends, um, then you know I'll, I'll make my observations in the field. Um, when you're selecting photos, you can select four at a time. If you have more than four, you can go back and, and add another four. Um, but they should all be of the same organism in one observation. So I just picked um, these cool orange fungus photos. And you can see that it has automatically pulled in the date and time. And it's pulled in the coordinates um, from the geotag in the, um, in the first photo. Um, and uh, those, so those core pieces of information, as long as you've allowed your phone settings, your phone to, to record um, location, um, then it makes it easy to, to pull in photos from the past. Um, so then the way that you will add an initial identification, or if you know exactly what it is, you can, you can add that, but you'll tap what did you see here? Um, in Android, I think it says something slightly different, but the concept is the same and all the core fields are the same. So once you tap that, then you will, the first thing that it will do is it will start um, pulling up suggestions based, based on visual similarity. Um, and so it's gonna look only at the first photo of your observation 
but it's going to use our artificial intelligence or computer vision um, model. And based on just visual similarity, it's going to return suggestions. So in this case, it's pulled in and you can see the top four um, species suggestions are all in the same genus. And so the model has a fair amount of confidence that it's in that genus. Um, and so if you want to get more information about any of those, you can tap the little I and read more about the genus level and look through some of the photos associated with that taxon or you can explore the, the individual species. Um, in this case, um, I am not familiar with any of those species, but um, it seems to be a good match for that genus level identification. Um, and so that's what I selected. And then I shared my observation. Um, so I had my, in my next slide, I have another, yeah, just a few similar screenshots of another um, another mushroom observation or shelf fungus observation, um, and uh, uh, you can see it also says um, for the top suggestions, if if it's a species that has been seen nearby, it will say seen nearby. Um, occasionally, it will it won't match with things seen nearby and it may only show you things that are visually similar. Um, and in that case, you certainly want to be much, much more cautious about using those suggestions. Um, we are in the process right now of, of doing a better job incorporating geographic information to eliminate suggestions that, for example, have not been seen nearby. Um, but still do do take those with a grain of salt, especially um, if you're new and and new to high naturals and and or new to mushrooms. Um, uh, we don't want anyone to ever make decisions about what to eat, for example, um, based on these suggestions. Please, please don't. Okay, can I break in with one question about yeah. um, G, the GIS or GPS information um, sure. with morel season coming up, some people may want to make observations where they're not giving away their mushroom patches. Can yep. you? That's possible, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. So um, there below where it says the location in this example, can you see my cursor? Oops. Yes. Can you see where my yeah. cursor? Okay. So this. Um, so this setting here called geo privacy. Um, there are three main geo privacy settings. One is open. That's the default. Um, by default, anything you post to iNaturalist is publicly visible. So keep that in mind. I, for example, obscure observations made from my home because I make a lot of them. Um, so this geo privacy option, it can be open or it can be obscured. Um, or it can be private. If it's private, it will not even show you what country the observation is from. So I recommend um, using private very sparingly, but if you choose obscured, what it will do is assign your observation a random point that is um, somewhere within a 0.2 by 0.2 degree cell. Um, so this works out to maybe a pretty, a decently large area, um, maybe 400 square kilometers or something like that. If that <laughs> unit of area means anything to anyone, um, I guess to compare it to DC, it, uh, it works out to probably be maybe roughly the size of DC. Um, so it's very difficult to associate an obscured observation with a precise location unless you have additional information or it's like on a coastline and the points are showing up in the ocean or something like that. Um, so definitely if you're concerned about um, about sh sharing precise locations of anything that you find, I recommend changing the geo privacy to obscured. Good question. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that if you know exactly what it is, um, you don't have to use these suggestions at all, but they, they do tend to come up pretty quickly and sometimes they're faster than typing. <laughs> Um, but you can type in here to look up a species by name. Um, and at this point, I'd expect that we probably have the vast majority of, of fungi that you would find in this area. So you can definitely use that. And then lastly, if you, um, if none of these look like good matches or you're just very uncertain and want to be really conservative in the precision of your identification, you can just type in fungi and it will broadly identify it as being some kind of fungus and then other people can come along and help refine that identification. So it's perfectly okay to add observations to iNaturalist with a very, very broad identification like plants or insects or mammals or birds because there's people who will filter on those and, and will help refine them. So, um, I wanted to explain a little bit more about the identification process. Um, I guess I've, I've already kind of talked through this with the addition of that video. Um, this is an, an example of, of a mushroom I found in my yard. Um, and in this case, um, you know, I, it, I'll, I'll confess that I've probably made a, a, a lot of not not very thoroughly identifiable uh, mushroom observations, um, but that's okay. It's not everything on iNaturalist can be identified to species, and that's fine. You um, I think you, you have to develop a comfort with um, with things being imprecise um, and, and imperfect. Um, and a lot of times, you know, the observations haven't captured all of the features that you need for identification, um, but, but it's often a learning opportunity. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully we can all do better next time once we know better. So as I've mentioned, Observation identifications on iNaturalist can start with a very broad um, classification like mammals and then be refined to something um, more precise like coyote in, in this example. Um, all identifications in iNaturalist are all connected to one single tree of life. Um, so this is what allows for extensive filtering and refinement and correction of, of identifications. Um, so if there's disagreement in, uh, in an observation, for example, like let's say if I identified um, this as the collared earth star and someone else came along and identified it as the rounded earth star, then the identification associated with that observation would just be earth stars. It would just sit at the genus level until enough people come along agreeing one way or the other um, to have at least a two thirds majority of, of identification. Um, so when it comes to identifications, there are always mistakes on iNaturalist. There's almost 60 million observations from every country in the world now, um, but there's always an opportunity for the community to help correct them. So I want to talk a little bit more about identifications on iNaturalist, but I first want to emphasize some other ways that you can use it. Um, and actually, if anyone wants to follow along with some of these, um, the document, this sort of cheat sheet that I made um, has some links that, that um, might be useful for starting to explore other observations. So I mentioned you can use it for exploring existing data. So I wanted to walk through, for example, how you might um, how you might use this general search uh, magnifying glass um, on the website to um, search for a particular geographic area, such as the Washington metropolitan area. If you start typing in Washington metro, it will start um, showing relevant results. Um, 
And if you then select view observations, it'll take you to a filtered view. We call this explore observation search. And now it's only showing you the observations that have been made within these 25 or so counties of the census defined Washington metropolitan area. First, it's showing the map view of this, but there's many, there's several different views of um, that you can use to explore observations. Um, so that's a very map centric one. Um, then you can use additional filters. In this case, um, you can click up into the gray filters box and then go select the little mushroom icon if you only want to see the fungi observed in the Washington metropolitan area. So then it's filtered further. Um, a more photocentric way to explore on iNaturalist is to use the grid icon um, because this is, is sort of an easy way to, um, to see to see the photos that people have added. There's also a little indicator down here to see if there's multiple photos associated with an observation, like this one has eight, for example, which if you're looking through, you know, if the first photo might not be that great, but there may be some, some um, additional ones, uh, so it might be worth clicking into. Then the list view is a bit more data centric. Um, you can sort things here, for example, by the, the time they were observed or the time they were added to iNaturalist. Um, so those are all different ways of looking at the observations themselves. Then if you click up here, there's ways to explore a sort of by species view of things. So this is going to show all of the different species that have been observed within the Washington metropolitan area, starting with the species that are most commonly recorded. Turkey tail and false turkey tail <laughs> top the list here for uh, most observed um, and, and identified, I guess, uh, species on iNaturalist from our area. I think everyone is probably nodding their heads right now that that is <laughs> to be expected. <laughs> Yeah, so then you can also um, look at who is identifying observations of fungi in this area. And you can see who is making those observations. So those are some of the key ways to explore observations on iNaturalist. If you want to, there's a lot more that you can do with filters. So for example, you could go in and in addition to just searching for fungi, you can go in and, and filter by month. So you could look at only observations that were made in March, for example, across all years. So this can be a neat way to, um, to explore if you um, maybe are anticipating um, anticipating some kind, some kind of foray or um, have a particular interest in, in, in species uh, in, a, in, a, in a given season. Right now I've been using this to go through and try and identify all of the um, observations in DC. Okay, I should say I'm trying to review them. I'm not identifying all of them. I can't identify <laughs> most of them, um, but I'm trying to review all of the observations and iNaturalist from DC in the month of March. I'm going to see if, how, if I can keep this up like throughout the year. Can I go through all the ones from March? It also helps me train my eye on what I should be looking for. And, and, and it's kind of fun to, to think about in a, in a, in a month by month um, approach um, for phenology. Um, great. So I, some of you I know are, are, have a lot of experience identifying fungi and iNaturalist can be a really great place to share your expertise. Um, so when you've got some set of observations filtered, you can also then um, within the filter box, click down into this, this little identify icon because this will take you to a view of observations that is a lot easier to move through quickly. So um, at this point, I think it's easier for me to just do a live demo because it 
would have required a lot of screenshots and people can also um, chime in if, if they have questions about this interface. So I'm going to switch tabs. And now um, you can see I'm logged in. I've got these same filters applied. Um, I'm looking at fungi from the Washington metropolitan area. Um, let's go ahead and make this just ones from the month of March too. Cool. So um, I can see these, this, this sort of thumbnail view of these, right? These are pretty small. And if I mouse over them, I can see if there's multiple photos, for example. Um, and there's this little agree thing. Um, I recommend though, clicking on an observation because then you're taken to this view where you can look through the photos bigger. If you wanna see it even bigger, you can pop it out to this bigger view and you can zoom in. Makes it easier to see those tiny details. Um, and then you've got several tools here. You can leave a comment. Um, if, you've, uh, if you're able to identify it, you can add an identification and this will just start searching. Um, uh, and you'll want to make sure that you, um, I'm, I'm just making stuff up here, um, that you do select one of the taxa that comes up. Um, and let's say you don't know exactly what it is, but you, you know it's not what it is here. In that case, you can add a general identification of just fungi, for example. And if you and, and this, this can be a way of correcting misidentifications, even if you don't know exactly what the correct identification is. Um, then there's some other tools you can use up here um, to get suggestions, either based on uh, other observations that have been made in the same uh, or similar places um, in taxa. So this is sort of, this is going up the tree of life here, right? Um, so maybe you want to see what else, what other insect destroyers have been recorded on iNaturalist from the entire state of Virginia. And this can give you other examples to review and you can see on the map where else it's been recorded. Um, you can restrict it only to research grade observations. That's what the RG stands for here. Research grade observations are ones where there is agreement, at least two thirds agreement at the species level by the community. So there's less likely to be mistakes in this category, though they certainly still happen. Um, this probably isn't so relevant for working with fungi, but um, you can look at nearby captive or cultivated observations if you're looking at garden plants, for example. Um, checklists, I don't know to what extent folks have filled out um, checklists on iNaturalist for fungi, so I, I don't think that's a major one that, that you'll need to um, consider. But then this, this last one, visually similar, what this will do is use the computer vision suggestions that you see when you're um, making your own observation. This is a way to use it on someone else's observation. And it's going to, by default, filter for this taxa. So I usually then clear it and see what suggestions come up based on just visual similarity. You've got the map there to check and see, is it something that's been seen nearby? So there's a lot of tools to help you um, uh, help you figure something out um, if, if you're a bit stuck. Um, annotations are used primarily for life stages and phenology um, for plants and animals. Um, I don't know if we have any annotations for fungi, um, so I don't think you need to worry about that too much. Um, and then here is where you can indicate if there is some kind of problem with the data associated with this observation other than the identification. So for example, if something, let's say you see a, um, 
a mushroom observation that is mapping to the middle of the ocean, you can go in here. It has coordinates, but it's showing up in the ocean. It's not because it's obscured. It's just mapped to the ocean. Um, in that case, then you can choose, you can vote thumbs down on location is accurate. Um, or let's say, actually, this, is, this has happened a few times. Um, uh, so let's say that someone has posted um, chalk or flour left by um, a, a group of people. There's this group called Hash House Harriers. They run through Rock Creek Park. They leave these splashes of flour or chalk um, and people take a picture of it thinking that it's a mushroom or a slime mold. Um, in, in that case, you could actually vote no, it's not evidence of organism or you could identify it as human. Um, this, this totally happens. Um, so that's when that evidence of organism can be useful. Recent evidence of organism, you can vote no on this if someone adds a fossil observation, for example, um, definitely happens. Or um, if someone, I don't know, adds a photo of a mastodon skeleton in a museum or something, um, that's also not wild. Anyways, these are things to look at um, if there's sort of issues with the data of the observation. Um, you can use the arrows to move from one observation to another. So this can be a quick way to take a look and on, you only have to stop on the things that you want to add an identification to. Um, in this case, here's an example uh, where someone had added a species level identification and someone else came along and said, no, it's not that species, but it is in that genus. Um, and Another thing I want to call your attention to is this little reviewed button. If you're looking through a lot of observations, even if you don't know how to identify it, maybe you, you probably don't want to review it again. Um, so these ones that you've looked at, you can mark them as reviewed as you go along, um, or there's a way to mark them all as reviewed when you get to the end of a page. Um, another really useful thing is down here, there's this little keyboard icon. And these are keyboard shortcuts that you can use to move through more quickly. So I've been using the arrow keys to go back and forth between observations. But you can also, for example, use just if you type the letter C, it will bring up the comment field. If you type the letter A, it will agree with the identification. Um, so I picked a safe one here. I agree, <laughs> this is a fungus. <laughs> Not the most helpful identification in terms of advancing it, um, but, um, but that uh, the agree function can, can be really useful. I would say you probably, you'll probably just mostly use that when you're agreeing with species level identifications. Um, oh, I can agree with this one too. I see, I recognize this one. Um, so definitely check out these keyboard shortcuts. They can be really useful um, if you start looking at a lot of other people's observations. We have uh, an expert on Russ on this call, so. Oh, cool. She, she chimes in. <laughs> So. Probably, probably going to say, actually, there's more than one of these things. Yeah, right. Very similar. <laughs> <laughs> and my, and my enthusiasm, my, um, oh, what's the word for it? My like naivete about how much I knew <laughs> will be dashed. Uh, happens all the time. I think, you know, um, I, I would say in, in general, um, you know, don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't want people to be overly afraid. If, if you're the kind of person who is really anxious about making mistakes, don't be too anxious about making mistakes on iNaturalist. If you're the kind of person who's really not anxious about making mistakes in general, you might want to be a little bit cautious about making <laughs> mistakes on iNaturalist. So I feel like there's a, um, uh, 
people can be um, overly confident in, in their identifications and, and maybe um, uh, stretch beyond what's, what's reasonable for, for them to agree with or weigh in on. Um, but more often, I think it's that people who, people who know how much they don't know are sometimes especially cautious uh, about weighing in. So um, I would say the most important thing when you're adding identifications to other people's observations on iNaturalist is just to make sure that you check back in to iNaturalist with some regularity to see if there's any conversations or dialogue on any of the observations where you've added an identification. If someone asks, hey, how do you, how do you tell the difference between these two very similar species? Um, it's always nice to, to be able to, to chime in on things like that. So once I've reviewed all of the observations on this page, then when I get to the end, um, it will prompt me if I want to mark all of them as reviewed. In this case, I do. I'm going to mark all of these as reviewed um, because I don't really think I can confirm, correct, or advance any of these identifications. Um, so I don't need to look at them again. And like I said, I'm trying to look at all the observations from DC in the month of March. So I just got a few of them out of the way. <laughs> it does take a few seconds um, to, to mark them all. Then if you want to look at more, this can be kind of an addicting exercise. Um, you can view more unreviewed and, um, and you can continue in that process. Does anyone have any questions about using this interface? We got a couple of questions. Someone wanted to know what it means if no one comments on your ID. Mm. Um, like if you post an observation and no one says anything? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so that definitely happens. Um, some, t I mean, I think what it means is that uh, no one who knows how to advance the identification has looked at it. Um, and I would say that it varies the sort of likelihood of someone weighing in on your observation varies a lot depending on the taxa and depending on the geographic area. So, um, and, and I would say also the time of year. Um, if you post something in the winter on iNaturalist, you're probably a bit more likely to get an identification because um, people can't go out in the field as much and they're sitting at their computers and just identifying stuff because they're bored. Um, but like, for example, when things get really busy in the spring during the City Nature Challenge, um, there's probably going to be some observations that kind of fall through the cracks and, and um, might take a while to, to get attention. Um, I would assume sometimes it's because you don't have a good photo also, yeah, right? Yeah, so that's the next thing I was going to say. Enough, enough information to Definitely. Say. Yeah, so it could be that, like, let's say, for example, that you have you have an observation that that is identified to genus, um, but it's just a tricky group. It's really tricky to distinguish those species. Maybe you need um, evidence that isn't typically captured in photos. Um, it may sit at the genus level forever, <laughs> um, uh, and it it may people may not be trying to confirm things at the, at the genus level. Um, but I'd say that there's, there's always, there's always hope. Um, and I've seen observations that have sat without attention for years, um, especially from the earlier days of INAT in parts of the world where there wasn't as much activity. Um, and then usually it just takes the right expert or person with, with, that interest um, to come along and and identify it. So there's always hope. Um, and someone asked, what um, are there characteristics of photos that will work particularly well with the AI if you have to pick the one that's sort of your cover photo that goes into the AI process? Yeah, so um, 
one thing that can be useful is that you can, in, in the app, for example, because it will always give you suggestions based on the first photo, you can change the order of the photos to, to run, to get the AI suggestions on multiple different photos. Um, so I recommend doing that, um, trying all the photos that you have of, of a particular organism. Um, when it comes to though, like what you put first on your observation, ultimately like for the community to see, um, I guess I would just pick one. I, I tend to pick ones that are a bit closer up so that people um, know that I have detail shots because for example, like I just over the weekend made a lot of tree observations and it's really hard to identify trees if you only have a far away shot. Um, and so I tried to make my first photo something that was a bit like a twig photo, right? Because um, I feel like if, if you're trying to get someone's attention at a glance, um, a twig or, or a leaf, if there were leaves, right? Those, those tend to be, I would say I try to go with like the generally most identifiable photo that I've got and use the other ones as, as supporting. And a couple taxonomy questions. Sure. Um, which is a hot topic in mycology because with DNA um, analysis, there's a lot of taxonomy changes happening. Yeah. So one question is just like, if you're aware of a taxonomy change that has happened, what's the best way to get that into the system to alert iNaturalists that there needs to be a change? Yeah, so I know it's really difficult for fungi. So we try to follow external authorities for all of the groups that we can, um, because to the extent possible, we hope that these um, taxonomic conversations and heated disagreements will happen on other platforms under the stewardship of, of taxonomically focused appropriate organizations. And then once things are settled elsewhere, then we can sort of bring that consensus view into iNaturalist. However, that is very difficult for some groups of organisms, especially fungi, but not only fungi. Butterflies are also a mess because there are strong regional authorities, but there's not a global authority. Um, so, um, because iNaturalist just has one global taxonomy, it means that um, somebody's always going to be unhappy with some of it. Um, but I would say the best thing to do is to go to the taxon in question. There are, I can show you taxon pages. So I'm going to pick um, just an easy group here. This is the taxon page for morels. And let's say that there was something happening with morel taxonomy. And I wanted to share that I would um, flag this taxon for curation. Um, and I might say something like um, needs to be split into three genera. Um, and then if I flag it, I might make a more, I can then add a more extensive comment that explains that cites the, um, cites the evidence. Um, and, and then the, co the community will try to figure out how, how best to approach this. Um, for really big changes, like to really big groups of taxa, um, there might be conversations that that also happen on the INAT forum. Um, I have not, I, I definitely don't have my ear to, ear to the ground on what's happening um, with fungi taxonomy, so I can't comment specifically. Um, but when, when, for example, if it's something that's happening at the species level, um, it is possible when some of the taxonomic changes happen for some of the identifications to be updated automatically, um, but it depends a lot on the circumstances as to whether or not that's possible. Another question that we got is th there are a lot of species where um, 
the there's a European species and an American species that have been split that look identical. Mm. I think this other question that we got is sort of referring to a case of, of that where um, or maybe it's it's so it's Tremedes cubensis. So maybe it's a South American thing. It doesn't occur in North America, but um, you know you see it assigned a lot to things in Florida. Should someone who's familiar with that issue be going in and correcting everything to the correct species name? Yeah, this one looks like a mess based on. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, um, so I think there's probably probably a couple things going on here. One is probably that this species is being suggested by the computer vision, and therefore has popped up on all these other continents, even where it's not known to occur, um, because of people not um, clicking for more information, and because of it being suggested. So basically, if if someone goes through these observations, especially the observations outside of North America, and puts them to genus level or otherwise corrects the species level identifications, that will help prevent more misidentifications um, from proliferating in these areas in the future. Um, so in this, in this case, I think that that yes, going through and adding identifications is probably one of the best ways to approach it. Um, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head if some of the um, if if some of the splits are largely geographic. Um, it's possible that some of them may have been automatically reassigned to the geographically appropriate species, um, but I'm not sure. Um, several people have asked about the differences between Sikh and iNaturalist. Cool. Okay. So I put some extra slides at the end. So why don't I come, come back to that? Um, um, did you have more you wanted to cover before then? Yeah, I okay. think maybe I'll go back to the slides in the interest of time. Um, and then I'll make sure to cover Sikh and, uh, we can, we can go back to the website if, if that would be helpful. Um, so I wanted to just share a couple other tools that are fun and useful in terms of tracking and sharing your own records. Um, at the end of last year, we released this updated life list functionality. And so this can be a fun way to explore your observations in the context of the tree of life. Um, so this, for example, is my life list and all of the fungi that I've seen. Um, and there's different ways to sort this and you can see a simplified tree versus a more complex tree. Um, in this case, it's showing all of the species that I've seen. These aren't my photos though. These are just the photos representing those taxa. Um, but if I go, to, sorry, this is not not actually clickable as a screenshot, um, look at my observations, or really cool, I think, is if I pick a particular geographic place, like the District of Columbia, for example, um, and I click unobserved species, it can show me all of the species that someone has observed in Washington, DC, that I have not seen yet. So this is just a really fun tool that I encourage you to explore um, once you've got several observations and, um, and uh, yeah, it's, I, I enjoy like exploring my life list and sort of nerding out on all the things I've seen. Um, I also wanted to draw attention to how iNaturalist can be used to cultivate community. So, um, Oops, there we go. So for example, um, Elizabeth created this project for Ma. And so if you haven't had a chance to join it yet, look it up and please do join it. The way this works is that all of your observations that have been made within the sort of greater um, Washington metropolitan area and, and Maryland um, will automatically be included. 
Um, and so this can be a fun way for you to see who else in Ma is making observations on iNaturalist and help each other with identifications. Um, so this can be a useful way to just find other people sort of in your circle in the sort of pretty large now um, iNaturalist community. And I think especially um, I think this can be a really good way if you are all supporting each other in, in this way on iNaturalist um, can, can help make sure that your observations don't get lost. Um, I also wanted to highlight just very briefly um, some of the ways that observations on iNaturalist contribute to research. Um, I think some of you have heard a bit about the fungal diversity survey. So this is a project on iNaturalist that um, rather than pulling things in automatically, this one you actually have to choose which observations you add to this project once you join it. This is what we call a traditional project on iNaturalist. This is how all of our projects used to be until um, a few years ago. So. Um, they also have um, fairly high standards for this project. So I'm not going to add a bunch of my observations to this project because they don't meet the, the documentation standards um, that they've set for this. Um, I encourage you if you haven't if, if you haven't heard of this already, um, do take a look. They've got a separate website and they have opportunities for being involved at much deeper levels. Um, if, if you want to get more involved and collect vouchers um, or, or use some of the more advanced identification techniques. Um, and then uh, by default, every week, iNaturalist shares this research grade subset of observations with this, this global repository called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And lots of natural history museums around the world share their um, some of their specimen data with um, GBIF as well. Um, iNaturalist is one of the most geographically taxonomically diverse data sets um, and it is the most cited data set. So when people download observations um, from GBIF, um, they can be traced back to this data set when they cite the, um, the download that they used in the resulting publications. Um, so there are over a thousand papers that have used data from iNaturalist um, in, in publications. So this is an important way that records from iNaturalist are used by the broader scientific community. So if you want to know more about iNaturalist, um, definitely check out this document that we put together that has some useful links um, for, for this group. Um, we've also got a page on iNaturalist called Getting Started. There should be a link from the sign up email that you get once you create your account um, and you can navigate to it from within iNaturalist. Um, this has some useful tips. You may recognize some of the images from my presentation. Um, and also we've got the iNat forum. So the iNat forum is where people um, talk about iNaturalist. It's where the meta conversations happen. Um, so do check that out. This can also be a really useful place if you've got, um, if you're encountering an, uh, something that you think is an error in the software, in the app or the website, um, you can report that under bug reports. Um, and uh, if there's something you think iNaturalist should be able to do that it doesn't do, um, you can put in a feature request. Um, and just generally discuss nature or um, talk about iNaturalist in general. Um, this spring, Elizabeth mentioned the City Nature Challenge. This is happening between April 30th and May 9th. So the first four days, which are a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, are the observation period. And this is a good opportunity to get out and make observations of all kinds anywhere in the Washington metropolitan area. Then between May 4th and May 9th, those are the few days focused on 
getting your observations uploaded if you haven't already because you've been out in the field the whole time, um, and identifying your observations and other people's observations if possible. Then on May 10th, that's when the results will be announced. So this is happening in over 300 cities across the world this year. And um, the collective results for all of the cities will be announced on May 10th. Um, and in this region, we're also planning to have a virtual event on the evening of May 10th to celebrate what we were able to find together um, and, um, and, and continue to build community. Um, there's a project for this on iNaturalist. Um, your observations will count even if you don't join, which is different than the MA project. Um, so for the Sydney Nature Challenge, anything you make in those four days um, will automatically count as long as it's within this Washington metropolitan area. But I do encourage you to go ahead and join the project because when we post updates to the project journal, um, then you can find out what's going on. Um, and it also helps us see um, who all is excited about and ready for the City Nature Challenge this year. So count and the countdown is on. Um, it's frozen in my screenshot, um, but it's 45 days away, maybe 44 now. I think this was last night. And uh, lastly, I want to thank all of you and I want to thank the iNaturalist community because iNaturalist is software, but it doesn't work without the hundreds of thousands of people who make it work, who volunteer their expertise, who share what they find um, and help each other learn about nature. So thank you. And I'm happy to go back and answer that question about SEEK, unless there are other pressing questions I should answer first. I have a few others, but yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about SEEK? Okay, so SEEK. SEEK is another app created by iNaturalist that has a slightly different focus. There's a lot of similarities, um, but I would say their primary use cases are different. To give you a sense of what's possible with Seek, um, Seek has the computer vision model running in the camera, so you don't even have to take a picture. You open the Seek app, you tap the camera icon, and just as you move your phone in front of an organism, it will start trying to identify it. Um, in this case, we're showing you some examples of species that it's really good at identifying, and so it can jump right to species. Um, Seek, we've designed Seek to be fairly conservative in to, to reduce the sort of misidentifications, um, but it means that sometimes you might be pointing Seek at a mushroom, for example, and it just doesn't get past fungi or doesn't get past some other um, you know, doesn't get past shelf mushrooms or something, or shelf fungi. Um, so uh, sometimes, um, sometimes seek won't work very well. It, seek won't work very satisfyingly if it can't get to species. Um, so I would say that seek is great for very distinctive organisms when you want a really quick answer, um, or if you don't want to post something to the community, you don't want feedback, you just want an answer. Um, by default, Seek doesn't share any data um, because it is privacy conscious and kid safe. Um, there's a lot of restrictions around apps that are um, designed to be kid safe. Um, and so if you are making observations in Seek, they're only being stored on your device. Um, so that means if you delete the Seek app, you will lose your observations. Um, we have achievements and badges built in for some gamification, which some people really enjoy. Um, so it's just sort of a different way of exploring. We do hope eventually to get some kind of instant feedback like this incorporated into the iNaturalist app, um, but it's it's uh, not just around the corner. <laughs> so it's something we're working on, but a bit far off. Um, 
another thing I wanted to mention is that you can optionally log into an iNaturalist account or create an iNaturalist account through Seek and choose to submit observations. Um, but um, you can only do one photo at a time that way. Um, and uh, you won't get the feedback from the community within the Seek app. You will need to look at your observations on iNaturalist. Um, so it's a little bit of a one-way thing from Seek into iNaturalist. So Seek is not, for example, um, the primary tool that you should use if you want to share data. If you want to share your observations with other people on iNaturalist, the iNaturalist app is really going to be best for that. If you're working with kids or if you don't want to share observations publicly, um, then Seek is great for that. And someone, I, I was trying to answer this question while you were talking, someone asked, um, they were finding an app called iNaturalist LLC, is that what it's called in the Apple store? On Google Play, it's just called iNaturalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it is. So it's it's from, it's from iNaturalist LLC because the app store presence predates the joint initiative with Cal Academy and National Geographic. Um, so yes, that is the right one. All right. Um, let's see. Someone asked whether iNaturalist does anything in particular for big eruptions like the cicadas that are about to come. Is, do you do anything special for that? Um, no, but the beauty of it is that people can organize projects to do that. Um, so if there's something like that happening, um, you know, I, a museum or a group can make a project to draw attention um, to particular species and places at, at given times. We've seen that recently um, to draw on a few recent events, the Australian bushfires. There was a project that came up to track recovery after the Australian bushfire. Um, after the California wildfires, there are projects to track um, recovery after those. Um, there was a project that popped up um, with Texas Parks and Wildlife following the Texas cold snap to document birds that died in that cold snap. Um, so there's a number of um, opportunities there, um, but iNaturalist itself doesn't um, really organize around those because um, with a global focus, we really we try to focus on keeping the app working um, and and really let a lot of the local organizing happen um, by motivated individuals and, and organizations. Um, I should also mention that iNaturalist doesn't organize the City Nature Challenge. Um, it is the platform used by most of the cities that are participating, but I only organize for DC. There are no other staff members involved at all in organizing the City Nature Challenge. It's organized by a colleague of ours at the California Academy of Sciences who's in their citizen science department uh, or community science department I should say now um, and a colleague of hers at the Los Angeles uh, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County um, and they do a fabulous job organizing the volunteers from almost 400 cities that are participating this year. Um, th this is probably more of a feature suggestion, but someone asked um, whether there's a way to pull up observations and sort of quiz yourself on them, or is the app always showing you the names that have been assigned? Yeah, so um, the, people have asked it, asked for a quiz feature before. We don't really have one right now. I would say probably <laughs> the whole, uh, yeah, we, I, in short, we don't have a quiz feature. Um, a, a way to, an open-ended way to do that um, is to, for example, um, here, I'll just, I'll put in some filters. Let's look at observations from 
Let's look at fungi from Maryland. And we can look at things that are only identified to family, for example. Um, so in this case, I guess it's um, it's the kind of quiz where you don't have the answer key, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but if, if you do know a lot of fungi, <laughs> this can be, um, uh, you know, depending on your idea of fun, <laughs> a fun way to um, to test your knowledge and see see if you can advance any of these. Well, and you could work on them and put in your observations and then see if anyone comes along behind you and agrees or disagrees, I guess. Yeah. Um, someone asked what the definition is for, for the feature that you were showing in the beginning when, when the AI says whether something's been seen nearby. Do you know how nearby? So near what counts as seen nearby? Um, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it, it's based on grids and I think it's I think each cell is one degree of latitude and longitude. And so I think it has to be seen within um, either your cell or any of the cells ad ad adjacent, immediately adjacent to that or essentially making like a what ends up being a three by three degree grid, but I might have I might have the units wrong there. It might not be an entire degree. It might be like half a degree or something. Um, I might have to get back to you on the details of that, but it's it's essentially make a box around <laughs> where you were, um, a not very small box. And if it has been seen in, in those boxes, um, then it pops up as seen nearby. And do you know how many people are on iNaturalist in the DC metro area, for oh. example? Yeah, so if we start searching for Washington metropolitan area and look at the observations um, across all time, 27,000 people have added observations. So some of them may have been passing through or have moved on, but yeah, that's a rough estimate of how many people. If we want to look at only people who have added observations so far this year, we can put this lower um, date range on here. We've got 2,280 people who have added observations from this area so far this year. Um, for iNatural stats overall, we've got this site stats. Um, and what you will notice here if you stretch out the time scale, iNaturalist has a pretty seasonal um, variation. Um, so it's a little bit hard to see here, but basically like December, January, February are our least busy months on iNaturalist, but then it jumps up a lot in the Northern Hemisphere, spring and summer. And we kind of have a sustained, I guess we, we call it the spring bump and like the summer plateau. Um, we're pretty steady activity throughout the summer and low in the winter. And is that big blip, the city nature challenge? Yep. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So we'll see what it looks like this year. It will, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to predict. I don't know what it's going to look like. <laughs> Probably bigger, um, but yeah, strange times. <laughs> all right, I think I have gotten all of the questions that I caught in the chat. If I missed any, I apologize, or people should feel free to ask again or ask new questions in the chat, but I think we're getting close to the end here. Um, we'll just give another minute for folks to ask any last questions, but this has been super helpful and a great overview. Definitely some things I did not know exactly how to do on iNaturalist. And I think just a great overview of all the different ways that it can be used, not just for contributing your information, but for looking at everything that everyone else has been seeing. And I'm super excited to, to play with it more. Great. 
I, I'll just plug, I have a, I have a fun little project um, that I made um, for observations from my yard. Um, so I've got, sorry, I'm not going to scroll all the way down because I can see my, I can see my true location. Um, but you, if you all go look at my project, you can't. Um, so all of my observations in this project have been obscured, but I added them all to this project. So I know that they're um, species I've seen in my yard. Um, and I've got over 500 species so far. Um, and uh, I know I'm, I'm still only scratching the surface there, um, but this has been a really fun thing, especially for the past year. Um, when I haven't ventured very far at all from Washington, D.C. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. This has been great. And thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. We had a great turnout. Um, and like I said, we will post this up on uh, the Ma DC YouTube channel for folks that want to review or pass it along to other other people in the club or other anyone else really who you think could benefit from from playing around more with iNaturalist and fungi. So thanks so much. Great. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you on iNaturalist.